this is what really separated the people who were thinking about the future compared to those who were looking at what's happening now. I mean, the development of this was absolutely unstoppable by any single person or even company. Even the government couldn't regulate this. And, you know, 30 years on, we're still trying to work out how to regulate parts of the Internet. There's a whole load of development going on right now that we have no idea where it's going to go. Let's start with what people are getting most wrong. Hello, guys, and welcome to the Car Shed podcast. The following is a recording of a conversation between myself and Jason Dean. He is a Bitcoin analyst, miner, and author of How to Explain Bitcoin to Your Mum. On top of this, he is community lead over at the Bitcoin Pioneers Group and was an employee over at Microsoft during the 90s. He has a huge wealth of knowledge about the early days of the internet, and this we shall be digging into now. Hello, Jason. Hello, Tatsuki. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Um, so before we dive straight in, would you like to um, give the listeners just a, a brief overview of your background and um, who you are? Okay, right. How far back are we going here? Um, so sh- should we go from... Because <laughs> we, we, we could be here a long time. After school, after, after school, school, right. Okay. We could be here a, a high level Yeah, let's overview. do that because we'll be here a very long time otherwise. Okay, so uh, let's go from uni, right? So we went to Aston Uni. I started off yeah. with a management degree, ended up specialising in law. Uh, which was, uh, you know, it was pretty interesting, actually. And I liked the sound of my own voice, so I thought Barrister sounded pretty cool. Uh, and then once I'd done yeah. that, um, I realised there was quite a lot of work involved. So um, I thought that was too much like hard work. So I went into marketing because, uh, you know, you can make that up. Um, so I ended up working at a company called Microsoft, um, sort of in the sort of mid 90s to the late 90s some people might might hit might have might, might have heard of that one yeah uh i was, was at cable of wireless for a while in a pretty uneventful sort of career move um and uh that's where i got involved with the whole internet thing and i'm sure we'll come on to that later on uh, about 2000 left microsoft started my own business i already had a couple by then sort of small ones but i opened a chain of internet mm. cafes and game zones Actually, it was in the late 90s. I did have permission from Microsoft to do this. Uh, and then I ran that until really about sort of the mid sort of teens. Um, and I started selling them off then because I discovered Bitcoin and uh, wanted to get involved with Bitcoin somehow. And, uh, and that's where that story began. Um, and eventually I sold all the, all, the, all, the, all the cafes and realized that this is what I wanted to do full time was, was being involved with, with Bitcoin. Now, I didn't know how I was going to do that, by the way. I just knew that I wanted to do that because I had that kind of similar experience of being on the cutting edge of the, of the Internet in the 90s. Um, mm. So uh, I just started writing articles, talking to people, um, and that led to lots of different opportunities coming about. And, you know, these days I do a lot of uh, media work, uh, do a lot of article work on the speaker circuit for the uh, Bitcoin and crypto community. And I'm uh, I'm, I'm loving it, frankly. Um, you know, it makes me feel like I'm in my early 20s again, because there's the same buzz as there was about the Internet at the time. Mm. No, it's an amazing story. It's amazing that you've ridden one huge wave being the Internet and... You haven't really dipped your feet into Bitcoin. You've thrown yourself, dived straight into the Bitcoin pool and, uh, and are riding the well, next Well, there's one bit I should add. There's one bit I conveniently skipped out of that story. was that I actually discovered Bitcoin 2013. But like many people didn't understand it. And I, I researched it incorrectly. You know, I, went, I, I Googled what do economists think of Bitcoin? So that meant I was reading articles by Neural Rabini and... and um, <laughs> you know, Peter Schiff and, and all these sort of guys and yeah. was convinced that it was all a complete mess. So I never pursued it and actually lost four years. So Peter Schiff's got a lot to answer for. That's all I can say. Yeah. He does. And it's funny, as you say, because you, you mentioned Peter Schiff. For listeners who don't know, he's um, a massive proponent of gold and he does see the flaws in today's fiat system. And so if anything, he should be one of the people who do like Bitcoin and the idea of it. Um, but, he's, but yeah, he, as you say, he's 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 got stuck on the legacy. He really has, and he's he's not just stuck on the legacy. He's absolutely anti Bitcoin, and really goes mm. out of his way to try and discredit it in any way possible. I have to say, as time goes on, it, it it seems more tenuous. I mean, I can't believe he doesn't see this. It seems like he's almost doing it deliberately these days. But um, let's see how that plays out, right? 
Definitely. And his son, his son yeah. is into Bitcoin. That must make for some really interesting Christmas and Thanksgiving meals, right? I mean, can you imagine <laughs> the conversations they oh, must have? Definitely. All right. Well, um, we'll go. We'll go a bit back to the internet then. So let's talk about the internet cafes because I, for me today, most cafes do have an internet. So what exactly was an internet cafe back then, and why were you starting them? Right. Well, this all comes down to, uh, you know, the very early days of the internet. I mean, now we have internet on everything, right? So we have it on our phones, we have it on our computers, and we expect it. We absolutely. The first thing you do when you go into a cafe is what's the Wi-Fi. You know, it's the first thing we all do it now. But you've got to remember this mm. was impossible 20 odd years ago. Uh, and in fact, most people still didn't really get this concept of being able to access information. Uh, and we can have whole conversations about that because there's some hilarious conversations that we, I've had over the years with people. But some people started to see the benefits of this in the sort of late 90s. Uh, but their home computers, they didn't know how to connect them. Um, and it was hard to do it. I mean, the internet wasn't easy to use at this point. So this mm. idea of having an internet cafe um, came about. And I think the first one was Siberia, if I remember, which was about 96, I think they opened in London. And immediately it was very popular with queues around the, around the block, you know, people trying to get in. And what they would do is, they, excuse me, come in and use the computer, which was connected to the internet. It was probably a very slow connection, 256K, which was, you know, incredibly fast compared to uh, what was yeah. available at home at the time, uh, which was usually about 14K. Um, and uh, they would come in and use a basic mail service or a you know, basic dating service, that even though were available then. Um, it was pretty awful, really, but it was just this idea that you could come in and use it. So this idea caught on because it meant that you didn't have to have this equipment at home. Um, and, of course, we saw that fairly early on. We thought, that's a great idea. I love it. Um, so we opened our first one in Guildford in 97, I think it was. Uh, and then Reading was uh, 99, Richmond, uh, early 2000. And uh, they increased, they got increasingly bigger as time went on. So by the time we opened Richmond, um, that was, it was, it was Richmond High Street as well. So it was like a yeah, pretty expensive place to be. Yeah. Uh, and we had a big game zone in each one. So you could do land gaming and, of course, printing nice. and everything. And we had a coffee shop as well in each of them. Uh, and we and we and we rode the wave, the boom time, you know, of everyone wanting to use the internet but not having access um, easily at home. Of course, ultimately we knew this was, you know, a business of its time. It wasn't going to be around forever. Yeah. So um, it became increasingly niche as time went on, and um, I, I I did it all right in the end. I sold it sort of probably a bit later than I should have done, um, but uh, did okay in the end. It's always it's always easy to think that afterwards. It's always the always case, is. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyone anyone in crypto or Bitcoin will know that. Yeah. Um, and so so to just to give readers an idea of how slow 14k was back then. What what does 14k mean, and how does it compare to say the internet in your house today? Well, the two things just aren't comparable. Um, so uh, you know, first of all, we, we all have fibre connections now, or ADSLs, usually some version of that that we have at home. Back in the day, these things didn't exist, so you had to connect through your phone line, um, and that meant you used a modem, which in those days was just a separate box that you stuck on top of your computer. You plugged your phone line in. Of course, you couldn't use your phone at the same time as you were on the internet, and we didn't have mobiles, so <laughs> you were offline from the world effectively. Well. Very it was, yeah, and you had to manually move your cable from your modem and plug it back in, in the wall. So um, how, how can I describe it? Well, first of all, you've got to remember most of the internet then was text-based. There was no point putting videos or even pictures in many cases on websites because they just mm. took too long to download. Um, I remember downloading a, a very short clip, it was about five second uh, clip of a basketball player, and I was showing my, my little brother at the time, was into basketball. And this clip probably took about 30 minutes to download. And it was this five second clip, and he was all excitedly waiting for it, and I press played it. It was just this clip, and he went, what? <laughs> that's it? <laughs> After 30 minutes? Um, so that's how slow it was. Um, so things have wow. really moved. And of course, the other thing is sometimes you'd lose connection halfway through, have to start again. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a great experience. I mean, I think that's the, uh, 
uh, the, the summary I would I would make of that. You had to persevere. Mm. You'd have to want it. You, you'd have to want to use the internet. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, given given that the user experience was so bad and it was so hard to use, like, why would anyone have even been interested in this at the start? And like, what what made you? What drew you into it? Well, that, it's an excellent question, and this is what really separated the people who are thinking about the future compared to those who are looking at what's happening now. And that's actually relevant to today as well, what we're seeing with Bitcoin, mm. because what really seduced me was the potential of this. Um, you know, I was thinking, this is fantastic. We can, we can do this. In the future, we'll be able to order things online. We'll be able to talk to people. Um, I mean, we never imagined things, you know, Web3 applications like uh, Uber or Airbnb. I mean, they just they just can't, yeah, couldn't get our heads around those. But we could see a time where you could shop online, you could order cinema tickets online, that mm. kind of stuff. So we could see it was evolving. And I was correctly positioned to see this horizon unfolding in front of me. For the average person who you get very excited and say, oh, come and have a look at this internet thing. And you sit down and say, look at this. And you dial up and the modem do, 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 make the little noise and connect. And then, you know, this this slow page of text would download. And they were like, well, teletext is faster than that, you know. So a teletext, mm. by the way, was a service that used to broadcast on, on TV. I'm not sure if you know what that is either. But um, I, I could guess, but I didn't <laughs> no, know. So no. On old TVs, they used to, um, you had a button and you could switch to teletext and it would broadcast text like screens of clunky, bulky text with updated information, which is updated usually four times a day, which will broadcast with the TV channels. So you could switch over to yeah. it. Yeah, like news? Yeah, there'll be news on there, there'll be weather reports, you know, there'll be stock prices, obviously not real-time stock prices, but, you know, things yeah. like that. Um, so that was how we got our information, and that was considered high-tech. So as a result, you know, trying to demonstrate to someone who doesn't sort of have that way of thinking at those at that point was, why am I looking at this? Um, and it was a hard mm. sell in some ways. You always had to find something, usually some silly site on the internet, which would uh, interest them. Yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, what then, why were you like... What, how did you discover it in the first place then? Because obviously it takes, you have to learn about it in order to see the possibilities and potential that it has in the future. But there's, it almost seems there's very little incentive to begin with because you probably didn't think you necessarily needed it, as you said, because Teletext was faster. So given that you didn't actually need it, why, yeah, why were you like, okay, I've got to learn about this? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the use case one is a really interesting. I actually wrote an article, I think it was last year. I got into a little bit of a Twitter spat with a journalist online. Not not big spat, but you know, I was just pointing out no. he was wrong. Classic yeah. Twitter. And because uh, he published an article saying, you know, Bitcoin has no use case. And I said, well, yeah, but don't forget, we thought this about the internet to start with. So, you know, you've got to work with this and understand where this is going. But the use case argument did used to come up quite a lot. Because uh, people would say, right, OK, even if they could understand the point that you connected your computer up to other computers. And remember, that concept was alien, absolutely alien. Mm. You had a computer at home to print stuff out from disks. I mean, <laughs> that was basically it. If you wanted to transfer information from one computer to another, you used a floppy disk with your 1.4 megabytes of information that you could transfer. That was how you did it. The fact that you could send it was next level stuff. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I lost my through the air, through the air is like these like magic the, cables. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, so going back to your question, it was a very broad question. But first, this first part was how did I get into it? Right. I was at Aston University and in the library there, they had a Reuters terminal uh, and you had to book this thing. And it was always booked, you know, weeks in advance. You only got an hour on it, but it was a telephone connection to their sort of database so if you were writing a thesis or a document or something if you were smart you could get on this and you could get a couple of extra bits of information that weren't in the books so yeah. that was my kind of first introduction to getting remote access to information and then by the time I, I'd left you I was just leaving in 93 the first rudimentary networks were in place where we could communicate with each other sort of 
email sort of system and I thought that was cool. And then, of course, when I started in the working world and they didn't have these connections in place, it just seemed weird to me. And I was talking to people about it and they were looking at me like, but that's just odd. Why I just go over there and talk to him and, and, and you know, I phone him up. Mm. So it was a whole different mindset. But to me, it was really exciting. And I really stayed on top of everything. I read everything I could. I wanted to know everything about where this thing was going. So when the role came up at Microsoft, which was all about sort of driving adoption of the internet, I thought, right, that's that's me. I mean, really, it was a brand management role, but I kind of specialised in this this kind of this, running these campaigns to get people get on the net, as as we used to say back in the day. That makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense when thinking about what you do now. For those who don't know, Jason is community lead at a group called um, Bitcoin Pioneers, where he holds a monthly um, a monthly webinar for basically new people to come into the space to learn about. And they also get ten pounds of free Bitcoin along with it. Um, so it's so interesting to hear that you were actually driving the adoption for the internet back then with Microsoft, and uh, and are doing the same now. Yeah, and, and that's the bit that really appeals to me, I think. And and what is interesting is the objections are the same. So you know, it seems crazy now having this conversation with you using the internet. Uh, you know, a standard. We didn't even think about. It. Didn't, didn't come on and say, "Wow, this is great, isn't it?" We're just like, "Oh, right, let's get on with this podcast," because uh, yeah, now yeah. it's normal, right? But and I thought I was so excited about the internet. I remember having conversations with people, and I'd look at them and explain it to them, all excited. Yeah, particularly as a young man, you get overexcited, uh, and they give me that really confused face. And it's like, right, so I we connect the computer to another computer, right? So what happens if I? accidentally delete the stuff on their computer what happens if i you know delete the website can the government track me if if i'm online uh, these are real things and then people got really angry some people were furious about it because they were like well you're enabling terrorists to communicate um you know doing this internet thing it's very easy now for them to communicate um what was another one? Oh yes you're uh, you're encouraging copyright fraud because people can just copy things off off the internet and people some people were really angry about it and really um quite abusive frankly uh, about this mm. idea of wow. um developing the internet uh, and actually I just thought another example I was doing a project for get on the net because we used to give out these CDs to people to uh you know show them what was on the internet because because they didn't have the internet so we used to send out CDs simulating the internet Mind you, though, it, they needed at least eight megabyte of RAM to run it on their computer. So a lot of people didn't have that much. So it was a, it was a yeah. slight, uh, that's megabyte, by the way, not, uh, uh, you yeah. know. What, what would you have on the CD then as a demonstration? It would be like a, like a closed mini internet. So you could click on things like you were using the internet. Because remember, no one had had that before either. That little hand coming up with a finger. People couldn't get their head down oh, yeah. there because they'd never seen that before. So that was a really weird thing. Um, and I remember contacting all these companies and saying, look, we'd love to put a little bit of your site on just to demonstrate, you know, a financial service or a, you know, a shop or something like that. Um, and some people, most of the companies were fine because they had a commercial angle. But some people that I contacted said, well, I don't support this because you're commercializing our Internet. It was very much like. Mm. This is kind of our place for geeks and nerds to talk about stuff. How dare you come in here? And make it all commercial and provide all these services. No, 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 no. So again, I've got another load of abuse from from that angle. Um, wow. And again, you know, you, you don't get this now because it's all accepted and and, it, and is normal. But uh, it's incredible to think at that time there were a significant number of people who didn't like the idea at all of the internet happening. I mean, they've all gone quiet now. I haven't heard from them for a while, so I assume mm. they're all using it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, did that did that then push back to the internet, kind of create a sort of cultish community in terms of people who actually did use it? Because um, I guess you're kind of trying to fight the world in a way. Um, and then I guess you also had the cohort where then the really geeky types who were like in it first kind of thing. And as you say, they didn't want these other people to come in and taint it. Um, almost, I guess you could almost call purists. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, where did you sit in that and how did that almost resolve itself? Well, I, it, it resolved itself because progression's inevitable. I mean, the development of this was absolutely unstoppable by any single person or even company. Even the government couldn't regulate mm. this. And, you know, 30 years on, we're still trying to work out how to regulate parts of the Internet. And of course, that's a conversation we're having now with crypto and Bitcoin, right? So it's going to take us years to work that one out because we haven't finished with the last network yet. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're in this exciting um, period of change. But I wasn't uber geeky, um, but I was kind of really into the concepts of it and the idea of it and the possibilities it could bring. Um, so I kind of fitted into the geeky camp because I could talk a bit of their language and I understood that kind of sort of culty this is ours you know internet was quite small so you bumped into someone else who used the internet mm. it was like well hey let's talk you know a, a basic emojis <laughs> just like just like a bit bitcoin. like bitcoin yeah exactly um so it did feel a bit kind of this special small community which gradually expanded into global things so we're you know we're no longer a special small community we're now a global community so but and, and of course we're going to see exactly the same thing uh, with Bitcoin because it is another open source network which again cannot be stopped by the government or an individual mm. or so on and so forth so we will see this exact thing um, uh, unfold I I've got to say to you um, actually you've got to look up some of these by the way because these are brilliant so uh, there you've probably seen I think you've, you've seen the 1994 Today Show you know the what is the internet anyway uh, question. There was one of those, and uh, that's a video clip. You've got to look that up. Uh, yeah. Really nice '90s suits, by the way. I, I used to love those. Were they Were they accurate? What they're disc uh, No, they're, the whole it's a two minute clip of the going. <laughs> I don't understand. What do you mean? How do we connect the network? What? That's, that's all it is. It's just brilliant. Uh, there's a famous Newsweek article by a chap called Clifford Stoll, um, and it's called uh, "Why Cyberspace Isn't." and never will be Nirvana. Uh, and I think that was February 1995. <laughs> and he just goes on an absolute tirade about how rubbish the internet is, and it will never work. Um, there's the Bill Gates and David Letterman clip. I don't know if you've ever seen that, because I don't right, think you've got to watch no. that, because Bill Gates, of course, my old boss, I did meet him a couple of times. And yeah. um, he goes on the David Letterman show to talk about the internet. And David Letterman basically just, rips him to pieces and makes fun of him you know so he's, he does a terrible job of trying to explain it but that was the other point he you know was trying to get this concept across was was difficult info world article by robert metcalf um he he invented by the way ethernet right so uh, but he had predicted the internet will collapse in 1996 is he the, he's the man behind Metcalf's law. I, I, I think he is. Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. Uh, then there's the famous Daily Mail one. The you know December. This was two thousand five years later. You know the internet will um, is a passing crazy. fad. Millions will give up on it. Paul Krugman's favor, famous comment about you know uh, uh, the internet will have the same effect on the global economy as a fax machine. That's a, an economist, Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, Another yeah, economist. Yeah. So, but then. The other one, the other side, look up, there's a 1999 interview that David Bowie did for the BBC talking about the future of the internet. And, it's, and he absolutely got it in 99, what was going to happen in the future. So the kind of creatives side could see it. But these... You almost have to be idealistic. I think so. In, in a way, yeah, there's and, part of it. Dream yeah, big. yeah. And again, that translates very well to what we're seeing now uh, in um, in Bitcoin. But I mean, there are loads of them and they are a bit buried. You don't find them unless you're really looking for them because we've kind of no. forgotten this I'll, is possible. Um, this is what happened, sorry. Yeah. So, but check it out. I'll link them in the show yeah. notes. I'll link them in the show notes. You've got to check them out. Um, so I want to come back to your idea of alien ideas for people to understand. Because I think, as you say, Alien back then was sending kind of text information. And I think, as you say, it's very similar to now. Is the, if you want to send money digitally, up until 2009, you had absolutely no choice except to use someone in the middle, a middleman, a central intermediary, be it your bank, be it PayPal, someone who will check both sides um, of the transaction and make it go through and it has to go through them and you have you have no choice and whereas without the digital side you can give cash in hand to absolutely anyone and so there's no one watching you there's no one saying you can't do that however 
With Bitcoin, the alien idea is that all of a sudden you can send this cash and it's digital to someone with absolutely no central intermediary. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's really hard for people to get their head around that and, and why that would be even be useful. And as you say, the, the things that the classic things that come up, it's like, oh, that could be used for terrorism. And so, I mean, what do you say to, what do you say to, I guess, the kind of pushback to these alien ideas and to help people try and understand them? Right. Again, I mean, there's a lot in that question, so let's try and unpack it. So, yeah, you're right. This, this, this whole thing about sending uh, money without the intermediary is, is alien. The fact that it is only digital is very alien as well, because even though mm. we deal with, you know, we do everything digitally, um, really, but... This, at the back of your mind, there's this idea that if you wanted to, you could still go to a cash point and get real money out um, because that's how we perceive it. It doesn't matter that 90% of it or plus is, is, is just digital. Bitcoin, of course, is only digital, only exists um, in, in this in this kind of whole digital realm. So trying to get your head around that is, is difficult. And I think the part of the reason is you've, we've probably all done this where you've stored something on a computer and you've accidentally deleted it. Or, you know, you've, you've corrupted a hard drive yeah. and you, oh, I haven't done the backup and it's gone forever. So there's an element of that, I think, of fear of because it's only digital, you can't back it up. Now, of course, when you understand how this works, you, you're not really going to do that. But it takes then you've got to understand a little bit of the technical side about how that works in the background. So then there's this idea, say, of the intermediary. What was the other part of the question you said at the end? How do you... Oh, the pushback. The oh, yeah. Was how... Right. Yeah. So, yeah, because some of the, uh, you know, things like the terrorist question, right? So you're helping terrorists move money about, essentially. Well, Bitcoin is kind of agnostic to everything. It's just a thing. It's just a commodity. Um, gold can be used in that way. Um, fire can be used to heat a home or or burn a building down i mean it's just how you use it and the fact is it's completely censorship resistant so your friends will use it but so will your enemies right but that's a different issue mm. to how the thing actually functions that's a human issue that we have to deal with and try and regulate and control in some way but you can't do it through the commodity itself and you shouldn't be able to do it through the commodity itself or really you're you know you're into the realms of central bank digital currencies and that kind of stuff which you know is very nasty and we don't want any of that so um so that the pushback is yeah it's an open commodity that's a fact people will use it for good and bad people use money for good and bad you know, criminals use money and they use things of value. Bitcoin has value. So mm. there's, there's your counter argument. Now, there are other arguments about, OK, so it's traceable on, on the blockchain. Um, so you can say, well, actually, you can you can you can see where that money's moved around and, and, and things like that. And criminals have got, got unstuck on this, of course, because their understanding, particularly in the early days, was no better than ours in the early days. They didn't understand that you could see it all on the blockchain and, and track it. So. Look, I think a lot of thought is a lot of commentary is made along those lines, but at the end of the day, it's overcomplicating it. It's a commodity which is available to all. Some of us are good people, some of us are bad people, but we can all use it. Mm. No, I think it's a really good distinction to make in that, I mean, take a kitchen knife. You can't ban kitchen knives because there are people out there getting stabbed because of knives. It's simply a thing that exists that can be used for either good or bad. And it more comes down to the intention of the individual mm -hmm. in terms of how it's used. Exactly right. I like that. Um, and so, yeah. And one of the other big pushbacks definitely to, well, I'd say the biggest pushback to Bitcoin at the moment is definitely the environmental side. Um, and I know that you're a man who does do some mining as well. And so what's your what's your kind of answer to those criticisms? And what do you think people are getting most wrong? Uh, yeah, right. So let's start with what people are getting most wrong. I think the, the assumption people always make the assumption that anything that uses power that they don't perceive as relevant to them is, is bad. Right. So um, Bitcoin, for example, uses less power than holiday lights globally. Now, um, if you think about that, that's kind of crazy, right? Because we're talking about something here which contains a whole lot of benefits for the human race. Um, 
and you're going right from things like you'd be able to take your wealth during wartime. I've written some articles about this, being able to transact uh, on a borderless basis, you know, having the freedom to manage control your own money outside of centralized control, your, your own monetary policies, if you like. All of those benefits can be given to mankind for less power than it takes to light your Christmas tree lights. So that gives you some context as to how crazy the whole argument is to start with. Mm. So there's two other points to this. The next one is we do actually have enough power globally for the entire human race. Uh, again, I've written a couple of articles like this. I mean, if you just take solar energy uh, and... Um, I can't remember the name of the article I wrote, but it's worth looking this up on my uh, medium. Um, there's enough solar energy for the for the um, that hits the Earth annually that will last us thousands and thousands of years. I mean, the numbers are incredible, and this has come from quite detailed research by various institutions. We have a, actually a distribution and collection problem rather than an actual power mm. problem. The issue really is that it all comes down to people think oh, you're using energy, it must be bad, we're probably burning more coal. But that's actually not true. By the way, there's some other great headlines to do with the internet. There's, there's a good one, um, what was it called? Uh, Throw another lump of coal on the, uh, on the fire. Someone just ordered a book on Amazon. It was, the headline was something like that. <laughs> but again, there was a lot of people saying, oh, the internet's using this terrible amount of power. But again, you don't hear that argument to these days either. No. Um, so... Uh, but there is another part to this story, and this is the part actually that even Bitcoiners like myself and Bitcoin miners like myself probably didn't expect to start with. Uh, because, uh, I mean, one of the books I wrote, How to Explain Bitcoin to Your Mum, there is a section in there about power being a problem for Bitcoin in the future. Because this book was written a few years ago, and at the time there was a general consensus that we have to maybe think about how we manage this power going forward. Mm. However, that argument has come full circle because what we've discovered is very likely that Bitcoin will actually be the solution to a lot of our energy problems. Now, no one expected that, um, least of all me. Even a couple of years ago, if you asked me that question, I'd be very surprised to, to find that there is this other angle to it. But there's two elements to it. So first of all, most energy that Bitcoin uses is, is renewable. And that has driven uh, investment in renewable energy. And the other part of it is power suppliers have discovered that having a Bitcoin miner on your grid is a great way of balancing the grid. And by the way, when you run a grid, you know, we just turn things on and it all comes on. It's, well, hey, we don't have to worry about it. But some poor guy or girl somewhere in a control room has got to balance the output with the input, with what they're generating. This is constant battle to try and balance these two things. And what gets worse is if you've got renewable energy, it's great, but it is unpredictable. If the wind stops blowing or cloud comes out, your energy level drops, but you've still got this. So you've got to try and maintain these in increasingly difficult ways. So what the Bitcoin uh, mining network allows uh, uh, grids to do is say, right, you use as much power as you want. We'll contract you to use that power. We we'll can actually, because we know we've got a buyer of last resort, if you like, we'll increase our investment in renewable energy and we will manage it by using a load balancing frame yourself. So if the grid needs power, you can shut down your miners. And don't forget, miners can shut down instantly. Like they really can. There's no other industry that can do that uh, and, and not affect the network globally. Mm. So as a result, these kind of contracts are becoming more and more common. And uh, it, it's allowed uh, grid operators, energy providers to, to produce more efficiently and to invest more and more in renewable um, energy. Um, so that's a great angle. The other one, of course, is methane. And you've probably heard about this. This is, you know, burning gas, very, very, very bad for the environment. Um, gas gas flaring. flaring. Yeah, yeah. It's really bad. This is definitely what, not what we want to do. But it's a byproduct of producing oil. And very often you can't sell that gas because you're too far away from grids. It's too complicated, too costly to build, to build uh, pipelines. So as a result, you um, just you get a license and you, you flare it off. Well, what's happening now is that Bitcoin miners go, well, actually, we can set up a Bitcoin mine actually on your oil field. 
we can just rock up with some containers, a generator, and we can save all of that, all that methane really going into the atmosphere um, and reduce down massively. It's about 30 times less goes into the atmosphere and we can produce Bitcoin mining. So all of these things have been happening very much over the last 18 months, two years. And we're now seeing a point where it's quite likely that the whole Bitcoin network will be carbon negative within the next year to 18 months. Um, uh, well, actually, some, some forecasts, I think, are 24, aren't they? December 24, I've seen. Um, yeah. Now, that's, that's incredible because we've gone from this massive energy debate to suddenly we could be carbon negative. And I think that's actually going to happen. Um, from someone who's sitting in the industry, I can tell you these things are happening incredibly fast. Uh, and people are adopting these um, these new new developments. So I'm extremely optimistic for the future. I'm very excited about the future, which is why I've just gone on a monologue for about five minutes about this very subject. So I apologise for that. But hopefully it's given you an indication of what's uh, what's happening in the future. No, I mean, there's some pretty crazy ideas in, in what you just said, which I'm sure most a lot of people will instinctively push back on. Yep. Because I think, as you say, everyone perceives energy to be one thing, right? Like energy is, is just you, it's just there. And if you're using it, then you're taking away from everyone else's energy, surely, because mm -hmm. there's, there's got to be a limited supply, right? And so then the idea that something can use energy whilst also potentially creating more energy for everyone else and then also potentially being carbon negative... I think, I think that's a, a really difficult idea to get get your head around. And I think, what like, can you briefly explain to readers, like, why is it that, say, why can't I just start a miner up today and build it in my build it in my back garden, or say, I buy a warehouse and I just start using energy and I start using electricity in the UK? Surely that's taking away from the electricity in people's homes. Um, can you briefly explain to me why that's why that might not be the case? Uh, you're not really taking it from people's homes because the grid will adapt to um, to the power that's required. So you just you're just increasing the the output requirements at the other end. So then it just becomes a question of okay, how is that power being produced? Now, if you're you know if we only ran on coal, that would be arguably a very bad thing to do because we'll just be shoving more coal on to you know make everything burn hotter and produce more more power um so that's not necessarily true of course i'm just i'm just giving you you know <laughs> the, the example now if you do set up something quite large like that you would need to have an agreement with the electricity company because as soon as you start drawing substantial amounts of power um you need to have an agreement they need to build that into their uh, into their provision and they will need to account for that going forward. It actually takes quite a long time. It's not something you can just set up um, very, very quickly, unless it's a small scale um, uh, operation. But even so, that it still all really ultimately comes down to where that power comes from. And as long as that power is renewable, um, it doesn't really matter that much where that power is going from because we have the infrastructure to 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 disperse it. It's just a question of how we manage that power generation. And increasingly, that power generation is renewable in some form or another. So, I mean, I know it's, it seems like an oversimplified answer, but that that is the reality. You can have the power. We can produce mm. the power. It's just a question of, is it the right sort of power? I think in the US, 60% of the, the electricity generated and the power generated is wasted. And it's only 40% yeah. that actually gets used in people's homes. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, as you say, it's, it's really important to kind of have the distinction of there's wasted energy, which is generally cheap. And then there's energy at peak times, which is more expensive when everyone wants to use it. And I think there's also, I think people don't realize that there's a limited supply of Bitcoin that can be mined each day. So the more miners that join the network, the more renewable and the more efficient the whole mining network becomes. Because anyone who's using electricity, say, when during the daytime, when you've all got your kettles on or the lights are on, during that period, all those miners who are using your electricity will be unprofitable, won't they? They'll be unprofitable during peak times. Well, 
Yeah, during if they if they're drawing energy at peak times and they and they don't have cheap energy, is it right to think that they'll be unprofitable and eventually go out of business compared to a miner who say using energy when using energy that's more wasted or as you okay. say on an oil site? Right. It, actually, I mean you've kind of answered the question in the question. It's all to do with where your energy supply comes from, right? So if you're on the grid, which is traditionally how miners first started setting up, you don't have control of that energy input, right? So what the way that they get around that is they agree a price per unit, which is fixed. Generally speaking, it's fixed. Now, you might have an agreement with the electricity company. You say, right, we'll give you a discount if you shut down for certain times in, in a year. So you can have electricity unit price a little bit less, but you have to switch off on these dates at these times. So that's one way that they can manage it. The rest of the time, it will just be a, a fixed price usually. However... If you control how that energy is produced, it becomes completely irrelevant anyway. So the oil field is a good example because it's literally just coming out of the ground, up into the pipe, straight into your machine, and you have control of that. I'm involved in a project in Costa Rica, which is a big solar project. And the Bitcoin mining operation is actually on that land. So the power comes directly wow. from the solar power. So again, it's, it's, it's irrelevant in, in, in that context. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the key point. I was going to give you another example, but really they're all the same thing, essentially. Um, it, it comes down to that, uh, you, you, your supply of energy. So the profitability argument really only comes into play where you don't have the vertical integration with the power supply. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the wastage point, I just want to make, because you make a really good point there. Power generation is what's well, more to do with transmission, really, is actually not very efficient, and you can't transmit electricity very far i don't know if you ever try connected three or four extension leads together like a really long garden by the time you get to the other end wow. the power you've got is massively diminished because it's just not an efficient way so imagine trying to send huge amounts of power you know dozens or hundreds of miles you know you've got a strict limit of how far you can go because of this degradation so the other point is bitcoin miners very often set up in places where there is excess or wasted energy. So it doesn't affect anyone anyway, because the energy would otherwise just be lost. So, and the other great thing about Bitcoin mining is you can literally put it anywhere. You just need a little bit of space mm -hmm. to stack up your miners and you could connect your internet via Starlink or something like that if you needed to. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I think, I think you've broken apart the argument pretty beautifully there. Um, I want to, I want to quickly touch upon then the future then and, we're we're running short of, short of time, and I don't want to I don't want to keep you for too long. So, when you look at Bitcoin and you say look at the next few years, how do you see the space developing, and what are you most looking forward to? Uh, well, we've got a long way to go. I think the events of the last couple of weeks have really shown how far off the mark we are right now, and actually it's even further than I thought we were because for most of us, well, most people still lump Bitcoin with crypto. And, and that's obviously they are completely separate things. But f f until that breaks, really, that link. Um, Could you briefly touch on, on why on why that's the case? Yeah, well, Bitcoin is a commodity. It's a true decentralized commodity. Altcoins, as we call it, anything that's alternative to Bitcoin is I think of them as equities, essentially. That's really what they are. In some way or another, they all have some kind of ownership, some kind of pre-mine. There's some kind of cantillon system built in there. Um, you know, they all have something which makes them not a truly decentralized or owned product. So I think of them as products, really. Uh, and although I do get called, you know, a maximalist for this, I suppose I am in many ways, but I'm not toxic because I also say to people, look, if that's your bag and you love trading with this stuff and you understand that these assets in many cases are owned or controlled by other people and not a decentralized monetary policy, then knock yourself out, crack on, you know, find the use cases that you like, support those projects, whatever. But understand that is different from Bitcoin, which is this truly decentralized hard money solution. Those two things are not the same. But they are lumped mm. together frequently in terms of how we think about them in terms of trading and buying and selling them, which is why they tend to move in, in, in tandem. Did I answer your it's question? An interesting yeah. Yeah, you did. You did, definitely. Because, I mean, I think, I think everyone's, once something has a brand of being decentralized, everyone just assumes it is. But as soon as you do some digging, you realize Bitcoin's, the way it's governed, the way it works it truly does set itself aside in how decentralized it is. 
And when and I think yeah, this is the problem with maxis is that you then look at the other stuff and say because they're not decentralized, they must be awful, right? But there could there's could still be things which are useful, which because there's some things that maybe you don't need to be centralized, but as you say, you need to know that it's not decentralized and you are playing with something that is more centralized and that can be okay. I mean, Hedera Hashgraph, I think, is one project and people think it's decentralized, but it's got it's governed by I think twelve or thirty. 30 big companies who will work for it. And there's nothing wrong for that if you know it and you're like, okay, I trust these companies or what's going on or for whatever my use case is, that's suitable. Um, but yeah, it's a good distinction. Uh, so then... Yeah, and I, I think, you know, you, you've, you've summarised that very nicely as well because, the, you know, there could be, there's a whole load of development going on right now that we have no idea where it's going to go. And that's something which is very similar to the internet because I feel, I was on Cointest last night just talking about this with Christine Lee and my view is that this, what's happening this week with FTX and, and all the other companies that have been exposed recently, this is very much our dot-com bubble bursting moment. So it's very much the same as it was the late 90s, early noughties, where we had a whole load of companies which, who were developing products or running in ways that just were never sustainable. It just was never going to work. But the market was booming and everyone was going crazy for dot-com stuff and we've kind of gone through that same thing because we never learn we humans we just do the same thing over and over again every single time uh, but out of that collapse of the dot-com bubble collapse we ended up with companies like amazon and google and all of these big giants who came through and they got it right they worked it out whereas all the others just fell by the wayside and i think that's what will happen here in terms of the crypto industry we're going to go through basically the wreckage for the next, this could go on for months, if not longer, in terms mm. of sorting this mess out. But from there, there will be some good projects which will evolve. I mean, I personally won't be involved in them because I'm, I'm only interested in the Bitcoin side, not the crypto industry. So I'm not dissing the industry, just to be absolutely clear about that. That's just not my area. My area is Bitcoin. And in answer to your question about where we're going with this is, you know, Bitcoin adoption will continue to grow. This may slow it slightly because of that perception, but it will continue to grow and it will reach a critical mass, very much like the internet did. When enough users start using it, the network effect comes in, that will snowball. Now, I don't know when that's going to happen, and I'm really interested at the moment from the end user point of view, which has also got better, of course. The internet was terrible in the 90s. Mm. That interface is still it's better than it was, but it's still not fabulous, and that's going to get better over time as well. And all of those things will evolve, I'm pretty sure, in the same way that the internet adoption did. And we, it will just become a norm for us through, through all of our products and services that we use. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And final question before you head off. So when you spoke about the internet, you said people envisioned, I don't know, people buying things online and being able to do these kind of services. Is there anything you envision with, say, as the growth of Bitcoin adoption grows, what do you envision as it can actually be used for? What could it protect people from? Do you know what? No one's ever actually asked me that question in, in, framed in that way. So I kind of I kind of like that. So it, it, really, you're asking what things will we consider completely normal in in in, a, in say ten years time that we now consider normal with the internet, I guess. So. I, I don't know, just walking into a shop and just paying for something automatically, you know, because now it's still quite a thing. Oh, we can pay by Bitcoin. Oh, let, let's film myself paying with Bitcoin. And, you know, it's still this kind of strange idea. So I'll just get this coffee. I'm, I'm on the phone in a bit of a hurry. Hang on, tap the phone and you just carry on. That's your Bitcoin over the lightning transaction um, done. So the normalization of that is, is something which is hard for us right now to understand. But I think we'll be there at, at some stage or another. Um, people will understand about self-custody. There will be better services for, for managing Bitcoin or multi-sig situations. There'll be a whole new set of services. And they may be centralized, some of those services. Um, but I think there may be some good enough ones that we would, we would consider using them as normal. You know, conceptually, where we go from here is is quite hard to imagine i i'd like the idea for example of being able to go and go on holiday and never have to change money again because i know that bitcoin mm. is universally accepted everywhere because it can be um you know my last trip to el salvador i didn't actually get any dollars i just went with my phone and, and used bitcoin now to be honest with you i did have to get some dollars because not everywhere takes <laughs> bitcoin actually um but i just i didn't bother 
because I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll try and wing it. But at some point, that will normalize, and you just take your phone, and you can pay wherever you're going for whatever you want uh, with Bitcoin. And we'll also think of it in sats rather than pounds and pence, which we translate to sats. So we'll pay, oh, that hotel's, you know, 3,000 sats a night, that one's 3,500, so oh, I'm staying at this one. See what I mean? That, that kind of decision making. So those sort of things, I think will happen and I'm quite excited about that because we'll be able to measure value between different products and services throughout the world easily uh, and that there'll be a constant for us to work with. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it looks like it's happening and uh, well, I guess we'll see over the next few years. But um, anyway, thanks for, thanks for speaking with Jason. Before, um, before you leave, is there anywhere that um, people can follow you or your writing? Yeah, I normally say just stick with my Twitter, really, uh, which is uh, Jason E. Dean. Um, I do publish some of my, my, most of my stuff on there, really. And if I publish on Medium, of course, it's behind a paywall. So I tend to put free links, uh, which bypasses the paywall on, on Twitter so you can see it. If you are a Medium, just look up my profile there, which is Jason E. Dean, um, and uh, you'll find me, uh, no problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, just follow me there and anyone can get in touch with me. My DMs are open on Twitter. I always answer. So, um, it's, there's a bit of delay sometimes, but I do always answer. Uh, so just get in touch, ask any questions or, um, anything we've talked about today or anything else about Bitcoin. I'm, I'll, I'm happy to engage. Okay. Amazing. Thank you very much, Jason. It's been great speaking to you and goodbye. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Before we finish up, if you would like a chance to see Jason Dean in person, he will be moderating and holding a workshop over at the Cowshed event in 2023. If you want a chance to buy one of the 100 tickets, please go ahead and register for interest over at our website, www.cowshed.org.uk. Thank you for listening.